So now let's talk a little bit about the network model. So how how do our uh, containers and, and containerized services uh, talk to each other uh, in a Kubernetes cluster? So the, if, if you had to remember just one thing, it would be everything on Kubernetes is one big giant flat network. There is one big subnet and everything is in it. The nodes, the pods, um, every, everything. That's fairly simple. In detail, that means that all the nodes must be able to reach each other directly, like no NAT in between. The pods also must be able to reach each other, so the containers can ping each other directly, they can connect to each other directly. And also the pods and the nodes um, must be able to um, talk to each other directly without NAT, without um, address translation, etc., etc. That's the only thing that we need to have, and then we, we can make that happen with any technology we want. So Kubernetes doesn't come with like a, a specific network implementation. We can use anything as long as it follows that, that the, these, uh, these specifications. Um, so let's see. The, the good things in that model uh, is that we don't have to worry about port mapping. Uh, we don't have to worry about, uh, okay, I, I want to expose that thing, but then to connect to it, it's going to be a different port number. We don't need to introduce a new protocol. We don't need to introduce like uh, encapsulation or overlay networks or etc. Um, this also means that we don't need to be able to port uh, IP addresses. Um, <clears throat> so for instance, a really easy way to implement that is to say, okay, you know what? We're going to have one subnet, uh, like for instance, a slash 24 on each node. Um, then each pod uh, will get an IP address in that subnet, uh, and then we just use plain routing between the nodes. It's like as simple as it can get, uh, and it works. And that's more or less how it works when you use um, <laughs> Kubernetes on Google Cloud. Um, that's and, and having this really simple spec means that we can use many different implementations depending on what we have, whether we on a cloud or on prem or uh, something in between. So now the downside of this approach is that by default there is no security since everything can reach everything. It means that by default, out of the box. Um, my pre-prod worker could connect to the production database. That's not so great. So if I want to isolate my workloads, I need to add something else called network policies. Uh, and network policies basically let me define firewalling rules. But this is not something that comes by default. So I, I need my network layer to support that. And it also means that I need to think about it. And this contrasts from other approaches where each application gets its own network, and by default, uh, networks can't communicate, they are airtight, and I don't have to worry about adding these network policies. Another um, downside of this approach is that since it's so flexible and since we can use anything to, to, to make it happen, uh, there are literally dozens of um, ways to implement network with Kubernetes. If we look at the Kubernetes deployment instructions, like in the documentation, it says, okay, so you need to set up the control plane, you do like this, you do like that, and then once you're done, you need to set up uh, the networking. And you can pick any of the following 15 uh, network plugins. And I'm, I'm not saying 15, like, oh, there is like 1,000, but no, there are literally 15 network plugins available, uh, and you can pick any of them. Or rather, you should pick one of them, um, and depending on your needs and depending on your infrastructure and etc., you may want to pick one over the other. Um, for instance, one plugin could use uh, a, a bridge network, like where everything is on a, on a big layer two network. That's great if you're on-prem, it's super simple. It's not so great if you are uh, in a cloud environment where you can't easily have a a layer two network. You will typically need a layer three network, so then you will need to have routing. In some cloud environments, you can't even have arbitrary IP addresses, and that's when you will need to uh, use an overlay network and a, an extra layer of encapsulation. Um, if you are using 
for instance, if, if you're on-prem and, and you are in, and you have some uh, um, BGP routers, you could use uh, a plugin like Calico or Cube Router, which will let you establish uh, BGP sessions with your BGP routers uh, and, and leverage that. But if you don't have that kind of router and you have no idea what BGP is about, then you probably don't want to touch this because it's a whole new thing. So, um, all right. Now, in practice, uh, what do we have on, on these clusters? Uh, we decided to use Weave, um, not because it's like uh, better or faster or anything, but because it just works pretty much everywhere. Um, Weave is super easy to set up. And uh, on these clusters, we wanted something that works everywhere. Because sometimes uh, we deliver that kind of workshop uh, using AWS. Sometimes we deliver these workshops using uh, clusters running on OpenStack. Uh, sometimes we use uh, Azure, sometimes Google Cloud. So we wanted something that was as independent as possible uh, from the infrastructure. And Weave is exactly that. We'll Weave will work anywhere um, as long as you have IP connectivity between the nodes. And I think if you don't have IP connectivity between the nodes, you have bigger problems anyway. Um, so that's that's why. Um, there is something called the, the CNI, the Container Network Interface, uh, which is the equivalent of the, uh, the CRI, the Container Runtime Interface that uh, we mentioned uh, earlier this morning. Um, the CNI is the the interface that allows for network plugins uh, to happen with Kubernetes. So the 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 CNI plugin um, is the the plugin responsible not only for allocating IP addresses but also setting up the network. Um, <clears throat> so the, the the way this works is that when a pod needs to be created on a Kubernetes cluster. The CNI plugin will be involved uh, at, a, at a few different steps. First, an IP address will be so. Sorry, let me rewind a little bit. Once the pod has been scheduled to be on a specific node, so we, the, the scheduler did its job and say, okay, that pod will be at node three. So then, uh, node three receives the instruction. You need to run these containers. Node three will then defer to the CNI plugin to allocate an IP address for the pod. Uh, and then at a later point, uh, it will again defer to a CNI plugin to set up the network for uh, that pod. And later, when the pod, in the in the life cycle of the pod, when the pod um, is deleted, then the CNI plugin will be called again to release these resources. So we have, as I said earlier, like more than ten different CNI plugins all with slightly different properties and suited to different uh, deployment models. And they they are not equal. What I mean by that is that, for instance, the network policies that I was mentioning earlier that allow you to firewall workloads from each other, um, all the CNI plugins don't implement network policies the same way or even at all. For instance, you could do your research and be like, okay, I'm going to deploy in this hybrid environment uh, using like um, Amazon VPC Connect um, and my data centers. And I think this is the, the CNI plugin I should use. And then later you could realize, oh, but this CNI plugin doesn't support network policies. It has like all the performance and flexibility features I need, except I it just does not support firewalling. What should I do? So in some cases, you can combine multiple CNI plugins together. You could add, for instance, there is a CNI plugin called Cilium, which could be used independently just to provide the, the, network, um, the network policies. Um, but sometimes you will just need to pick a different CNI plugin. Uh, 